Hello, good afternoon. Today our guest is Professor Joanne Cavallo. Hello, Joanne, how are you doing? Hello, Lipton, doing fine. How are you? I'm great. So, jo Joanne, you are an expert in literature. You know a lot about Renaissance literature, African literature, and I just love reading your articles. You're just brilliant. I I'm a big fan, Joanne, as you should know by now. But we're going to begin by talking about, Nico by, by talking about Machiavelli. Jo Joanne, who was Machiavelli? Well, Machiavelli is, I think he's known in the US as the author of The Prince, but he was also a playwright, a poet, and in addition to political works such as The Prince and The Discourses, he wrote histories as well. So he's really an all around uh, literary figure. Before he turned to literature, he was a man of action and he was um, a participant in the Florentine Republic in between the, say, the fall of the Medici in the late 1400s and the return of the regime in 1512. Yes, Joanne, you, you are correct. Most of us are familiar with his work, The Prince. Presently, I have the abridged version in front of me, translated by W.K. Marriott and the foreword was done by Chris, Christopher S. Silenza. It's, a, it's, it's the abridged version, so obviously it's shorter. But jo, 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 Joanne, I've read your pieces on Machiavelli, and I'm guessing that for those of us who follow your work, we're surprised. Is liberty central to his philosophy? Well, surprisingly, yes, but it's not given any focus really, except for I think there was one article I found when I started writing by um, Marsha Kolish, I believe, on liberty. And she came to the conclusion that Machiavelli equated liberty with private rights. And that intrigued me because it was something that seemed to be coming up over and over again when I taught my course on Machiavelli. So I went back more systematically and found that if you're not looking at what he says about the state as protagonist, but the state as antagonist who uh, could harm or damage people and their liberties, a, a different picture emerges. And I wanted to bring up that aspect of Machiavelli's work. Yes, you, you, you wrote a piece titled On Political Power and Personal Liberty in the Prince and the Discourses. And I read this piece and the shorter version for Mises titled Feudalism and Cronism in Machiavelli's Italy. Surprisingly, it, it, it seems that Machia, Machiavelli was also an advocate of a strong civil society. Yes, he thought that the two should be more or less separate, that the prince, if he wanted to keep his power, should interfere as little as possible or intervene as little as possible with civil society, which was able to uh, prosper on its own, uh, the less that the prince uh, became involved and that the prince should in fact spend his time hunting so he could be physically fit and uh, explore the geography so that in times of defensive warfare, he would be able to be at the front of his troops as the commander, which would be a piece of advice I'd love all of the rulers of today to follow as well. Yes, and uh, Joanne, your expertise is in literature, but you are the master at, at transferring skills acquired in literature to, to analyze political philosophy. philosophy. And, uh, and at some point, I expect you to do an analysis of economics and its relationship to Machiavelli. So, for example, I'm, I, I read your piece, and in, in one of your paragraphs, you write, in the discourses, Machiavelli posits two theoretical scenarios for the origin of cities, voluntary internal accord and external aggression. And we're going to focus on the former, voluntary internal accord. Medieval cities are really important in economic history. They, they were designed as legal charters and they promoted long-term development. So again, M Machiavelli was not only a, a brilliant political strategist, but also a rather astute eco economist who appreciated the, the value of voluntary organization. Yeah. 
Lipton, you're breaking up a little bit. So I didn't get all of that, but oh. I agree. I agree with you on that in the sense that he claimed to have no knowledge at all of economics in a letter to his friend and said, since he was completely uh, illiterate or a foreigner to um, economics, he would concentrate on politics, which is what he knew best. However, when he does talk about economy, he treats it as um, someone who respects the workings of the free market. And, and I'm, when you said I was a master, I'm certainly not. But there, uh, I'm, I'm a reader and a student uh, more than anything of, uh, of medieval history. But those who are experts say that the flourishing and the prominence of the various Italian states in the Middle Ages and early Renaissance was due to the decentralization and to the relative uh, freedom of the economy. Yes, Joanne, can you he hear me now? Yes, now I do. Okay, I, I, yes, but I, I hope we will continue to function smoothly. Luckily, when I'm po when when the video is posted, the viewers they will hear me well. But I'm I'm looking at your your paper, so I read econ economics. None of us are expert, but Machiavelli, Joanne, oh my God, this paper is a masterpiece. When let me read a, a snippet. When in the Prince Machiavelli alerts the reader that he will re-examine traditional vices and virtues as he seeks the real truth of things, the very first definition he overturns is that of liberality and miserliness. Working against the celebration of magnificence in the mirror for Prince's genre popular at the time, Machiavelli exposes a prince so a prince's so-called generosity as nothing other than robbing from the entire population in, in order to shower lav lavish gifts on a privileged elite. Is Machiavelli even talking about rent seeking? You know, he does distinguish um, the feudal uh, landed class who have their monies in an illicit way and exploit those who work their land. He, he distinguishes them from the, say, the merchants in Venice who gain their wealth through commerce and who are not exploiting anyone but trading. Yeah, but Joanne, Max, what what inspired you to study Machiavelli? Be, uh, maybe you maybe you have, have yet to appreciate the value of what you have done, but I do greatly, Joanne. What your work is is a big deal, and I'm not saying to flatter you, but it's a big deal. What led you to study Machiavelli in this light? Oh, thank you. You're very kind, Lipton. I'm an admirer of yours, so that's I'm very um, humbled by you saying that. Yeah. Well, since I studied the Renaissance. My main field is the Renaissance romance epic, but very often the epic poets are talking about the uses and abuses of power within, their, within the, the fiction of their poems. So as I study Renaissance literature, I'm also interested in the Renaissance, Renaissance history, society, politics. And every so many years, I teach a course on Machiavelli, going through most of his works. The last time I taught Machiavelli was fall of 2012, so it's been a while, but I'm fascinated by him as an author. I had written an earlier article entitled Machiavelli and Women, and there I also try to overturn a stereotype about Machiavelli being misogynist, whereas in fact, his writings show that he had a lot of respect for the autonomy of women, both uh, actual in his life and fictional. Joanne, I have a list of questions to ask, ask, but if there's anything interesting about Machiavelli, just go ahead and say it. I did not know about his relationship to, to women. So if there are novel theories, just tell us about them. Uh, in a nutshell, um, in basically any work of Machiavelli, when he refers to fictional um, female characters or 
actual women, he attributes to them an agency to think for themselves. And he doesn't treat them as secondary citizens, which was customary for that period of, of time. So there's a lot of surprising things when you read Machiavelli, because I think we go in expecting a certain picture of this preacher of evil that started with the um, Protestants in England who were prejudiced of, against many Italian things, not only Machiavelli, but who um, grabbed onto this image of Machiavelli as somehow diabolical. But I think if you go back with the lens of seeing his idea of looking for the, the lesser evil, so not necessarily ends justify the means, which sounds sinister, but um, he says at one point in The Prince, prudence is the ability to uh, assess the nature of the threat and to accept the lesser evil. And I think that is what he does in The Prince by assuming that the prince is a predator, is a would-be tyrant, is ruthless. He's not going to teach the prince how to be ruthless. The prince is already ruthless and he accepts that and he's not going to be hypocritical about it. But under, their, under those circumstances, I think his mm, way of um, uh, moving ahead is to think under these circumstances, what is the lesser evil? And that would be to try to dissuade the prince from harming the people as much as possible. And many chapters in his work can be viewed in that way. So I won't go into details because I think you had questions. Yes, yeah, so, uh, but th this is one of our latter questions on economics, and I'm just saying this to educate our audience. Machiavelli was also a fan of low taxes, and as modern empirical research has shown, there's a relationship between tax rates and economic growth. I, I, again, I'm surprised because I know Machiavelli as a student of international relations and political philosophy. I, I didn't interpret his work as a form of economic analysis, but my God, he's so sophisticated. And, and surprisingly radical because the example he gives about the German states as a model is that when it is necessary to gather taxes of one or 2%, the way that it, it's uh, gone about is that the Germans go to a place and without anyone watching them, deposit the amount that they feel they are able to pay. So there's no control on what they pay, meaning that is voluntary. It's their, with their consent. So it's not only a question of low taxes, but a question of taxes that are not coerced from the people. That's pretty radical. Yes, and uh, did Machiavelli support a constitutional government? Because this is what, what, what you write in your article. Indeed, it may be the ruling factions provo pro proverbial disregard for private property rights that prompts Machiavelli's insistence that the prince keep his hands off the people's property. Not only will the prince always avoid being hated, and I'm quoting Machiavelli now, if he abstains from the property of his subjects and citizens and from their women, but he will actually gain their favor. As long as he does not rob the great majority of their property or their honor, they remain content. Yes, in, in fact, many people uh, know this uh, quotation from Machiavelli that it is better to be feared than to be loved. But the full quotation is, but under all circumstances, the prince should avoid being hated. And if you go through the prince, that it's like a refrain. That's the statement that's made most often. The prince must, at all, under all circumstances, avoid being hated. How does he do that? First, as you said, keeping away from the property of his subjects. But there are other ways as well. Another way is looking at... Um, 
internal affairs and foreign affairs. Um, internally, a danger to the prince was conspiracy. And how do you avoid conspiracy? Not by having spies or surveillance, but by not being hated by the people. Because once you're hated, the prince will, should fear everything and everyone. In foreign policy, is it better to have fortresses? And he goes through different examples of rulers who had fortresses, which protected them within their cities. And remember that in medieval Italy, the cities themselves were walled. Um, so there's a sense of a constant threat from the, from the outside. So should a prince have a fortress? Well, he says that depends because what really the best fortress is, turning this metaphorically, is to not be hated by the people. And then he talks about arms and does something else which is quite surprising for the time and even for our time is to say, if a prince finds the people unarmed, he should arm them. Because if a prince disarms the people, they will be offended thinking that he doesn't trust them and they will begin to hate them. So again, that is not in, in the interest of the prince. How, just to, to finish this, this thought, while he is doing his hunting and protecting the people on military campaign, campaigns, there should be in place just laws, just in institutions, a grand council. So that goes back to your question about a, a republic. I think Machiavelli is slipping in a republican form of government, even when a single um, ruler has taken over a state. So that's, it's a de facto republic nonetheless. And on top of that, he wants to institute guardians of liberty. And these um, officials will make sure that no one's liberty is harmed, uh, regardless of rank. Wow. Joanna, when, are you, when can I get my book? <laughs> I don't think I'm writing uh, a book on Machiavelli, any, at least any time soon. Okay, because th this is book material. So many people are unaware of what you're saying. Because when I just discovered discover your writing on Machiavelli, it came as news to me. And I'm sure that my listeners will really appreciate your work. And your snippets are just so revealing. So, for example, Machiavelli perceived man to be a rational economic animal. This is what this is what is intimated in the in the following essay when he notes that it is easier to forget one's father than the loss of property, because men sooner forget the debt of their father than the loss of their patrimony. Right, and he also says that it is a lot um, easier and, and more tempting for the prince to take property from others, uh, much more difficult to execute someone. And so he's not uh, advocating that the prince go out and kill people, but not take their property. He's saying on the contrary, that um, since it is such a temptation, the prince needs to be ever more vigilant in avoiding uh, and, that, uh, theft. And, and Machiavelli is also Jeffersonian and Spencerian in his analysis. So for example, it is natural for the state to grow. The, the political state thrives on power. And this is what is indicated in, in, in your piece when Mac Machiavelli is quoted, it is always possible to find pretexts for confiscating someone's property. And the prince who starts to live by repine always finds pretexts for seizing what belongs to others. Yes, thank you for reading that quote. That's kind of what I was uh, in a more jumbled up way. Uh, referring to. Thank you. Um, and Machiavelli was pessimistic, probably with reason, given the state of affairs in Italy at the time. So when he went back to the traditional or Statilian division of government into uh, 
three forms, the, the principality, the aristocracy, and the democracy. He said that these inevitably, um, well, that they are pernicious and pestiferous, I think are his terms translated into English, because they so easily fall into three very bad forms of government, tyranny, oligarchy, and what he calls licentiousness. So he had a, a we could say realistic or pessimistic view of um, government that comes through in his writings. And if I can, I wanted to quote uh, two sentences from another work of Machiavelli called The Golden Ass. It's a poem that remains unfinished, somewhat satirical, in which um, Machiavelli is going to be um, transformed into um, a donkey, and, and he has a conversation with various people. And he makes, and this is just two sentences I want to read because I think it, it also highlights what we've been talking about regarding the prince. That which more than anything else throws kingdoms down from the highest hills is this, that the powerful with their power are never sated. This appetite destroys our states and the greater wonder is that all recognize this transgression, but not one flees from it. So it seems it's, I mean, thinking forward to Lord Acton, it's just that the, those in power seek ever greater power and that leads to the downfall of the, themselves and the states that they are seeking to rule. And, and, and Joan, so I've read your piece and I have a question. Did Machiavelli, did, okay, did Machiavelli conceive of property rights as the basis of a free society? I believe so. I mean, I mean it was part of the traditional uh, in, in law, in theory, but in practice, it was not respected. So as different political factions came in and out, uh, the losers in any battle would be exiled very often and their property would be confiscated and given to the winners. So there was in practice very little um, uh, respect of property. And there are passages, especially in the discourses where he talks about the common utility of a free state is precisely the um, allowing men to uh, prosper through their production and their commerce and not threaten to take uh, their stuff away from them. And, and Machiavelli was also interested in virtue and inculcating virtue in the, in the king and also into the brother body politic. But what I deem to be striking about Machiavelli is the idea of separation of individual and state and the concept that the king is also the subject of the law. As you write, Machiavelli declares that not even the power of kingship can justify infringing upon human freedom in this way. Quoting Machiavelli, it behooves, therefore, every man to shun them and to prefer rather to live as a private citizen than as a king with such ruination of men to his core. So there's nothing to Machiavelli more egre yes, egregious that, than, than ruining other people. But you may go ahead now and speak. Yes, that... Um, that particular pronouncement, which is quite uh, moralistic, uh, refers to Philip of Macedonia's movement of, his, of subjects from one place to another. So taking away the autonomy of, of one's person uh, and right to remain on their, on their property. But I think Machiavelli was careful to not appear moralistic. He, I mean, he was talking to a prince that would be tyrant. You can think if he's, if someone's talking to a, a gangster or a mobster and trying to uh, 
lessen the damage of the community, he, you're, he's not going to come off uh, trying to persuade that gangster to turn into a, a boy scout or a choir boy. He's going to dig into the self-interest of the gangster without seeming moralistic. And I think that is part of Machiavelli's strategy. When he talks about the prince, the prince um, needs to be reined in like a wild horse. Uh, the prince is a bird of prey. He uses this metaphor with regards to uh, the Neapolitan king, uh, Ferdinand. Uh, and in the metaphor, the little, it's the Italian princes, so the smaller rulers, are small birds of prey, not realizing that there are larger birds of prey after them. And the larger birds of prey would be the, the other European states, France and uh, Spain, who uh, invaded Italy. So he doesn't have a, a very positive view of the moral aims of a ruler. So I don't think he appeals to the ruler's morality, but he appeals to the ruler's self-interest. Joanne, but Machiavelli is also eclectic. Yes, we're, we're presenting, it, presenting Machiavelli as a defender of the free market, but at the same time, there is an element of Georgism in his ideas. So for example, you write, while rightful property owners must be free from aggression, this does not pertain to idle title older, holders who are said to continually aggress against the peasant, peasants who are engaged in working the land. So the idea promoted by Henry George that there should be a land tax to encourage productivity. I'm not saying that Machiavelli supported a land tax, but Machiavelli has no interest, it appears, in the unproductive class. If you're a property owner, you must exploit those resources. Right, and he was not actually from a, an aristocratic uh, class himself. He... Uh, was a humanist, um, very educated, but he was um, of, a, of a family that uh, worked and did not live off of others. But, uh, and again, I asked the question earlier, but the writings of Machiavelli are so prescient. So I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting a clear cut answer, but Joanne, how could we have ignore the, the, the brilliance of Machiavelli in relation to economics? I don't know. I, I think there, it is a complicated answer, but once he got a bad reputation uh, and he didn't uh, also have a good reputation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the church, because at the time, the Italian church was very secular, and the Pope were just as ruthless in their machinations as any secular ruler. And I think he was laying bare for all to see uh, the, say, the dirty side of, of politics. So he, he didn't win himself... Um, many admirers among uh, the English, but also I suppose um, among the, the Italians early on. But, but everyone has a way of reading Machiavelli by picking up different um, phrases or statements that he makes. He's not a systematic writer. So I see a tendency that I thought was ignored and I wanted to bring that out. Um, but I suppose you can go through Machiavelli and pick out other statements that could apparently contradict that. And so it's not a systematic uh, treatise on statecraft that he is presenting with us, especially in The Prince, which was written um, in, a, in a hurried way after he was removed 
from office at the return of the Medici. He was fine. He was accused unjustly. Uh, he was actually imprisoned and tortured for various months because his name ended up on the list of possible conspirators against the Medici. And he wrote two sonnets to Giuliano de' Medici um, on his torture and request for liberation. And is this what you do to poets? So he considered himself a poet in his self um, description. So, yes. so it, the prince can, I mean, Machiavelli has, uh, is the subject of so many different interpretations, more or less justified depending on both the view of the interpreter and on the particular passage of Machiavelli that's being highlighted. Exactly. So I, I don't want to impose modern philosophies on Machiavelli, but I'm wondering, is there also an air of, Weber, of Weberian bureaucracy in his thought? Because in your piece, Machiavelli averts the separation of politics from economics, and Machiavelli seems to prefer efficient bureaucracies that are staffed by competent people and not political cronies. Yes. And while he was in the government, uh, any documentation that has been uncovered by uh, the scholars of Machiavelli or historians of Machiavelli, uh, all of that points to his uh, earnestness in carrying out his job. He does not seem to have been corrupt at all or to have profited from the role he had in government as the uh, the secretary of the ten, which was involved in um, in foreign affairs. All right, Joanne, are there aspects of Machiavelli that you would like to discuss that I am not re referring to? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Nothing is coming. Oh, nothing is coming to your mind at the moment because this is a, a multifaceted thinker. I, I underestimated Ma Machiavelli before reading your articles, but prior to, 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 to reading your pieces, I bought a book. So I, I was exposed to Machiavelli as a student in high school, then as a college student. So I read The Prince. And by reading The Prince, I said to myself, we overestimate the real politic of Machiavelli. On one hand, Machiavelli is seen as this proto-advocate of real politic, but in essence, Machiavelli is basically designing a state to ensure human flourishing. That's the impression I get by reading the abridged version of The Prince. It doesn't seem to be devious to me. That's a good point. And I, and I would, I guess, bring up the fact that Machiavelli was not only thinking of how to protect the citizenry from a rapacious prince, but also how to pr protect the Italian states, and in this case, the Florentine state, and, and not state, the, the patria, which would be not the political state, because that was always changing, but the non-political or what um, uh, Randall Horn would call the country or that say society, how to, so he's thinking not only how to protect the people from the prince, but how to protect all of his society from the external forces that were devastating Italy at the time. And perhaps for that reason, a one man rule would be expedient means uh, in order to stop the colonization of Italy on the part of the French and the, the Spanish. Uh, jo Joanne, Ma Machiavelli, was he critical of democracy? From various statements he makes, it seems clear that he preferred a Republican form of government in normal circumstances to the principality. How 
ever. He also makes um, a statement that if I can find it quickly, um, let's see. Oh, I had I did have it in my article that is is so surprising because he perhaps if you'll just give me a minute. I didn't realize this was so long. Okay, here it is. And he's talking about um, how government can be a parasitic institution feeding off a civil society. And here he's talking about republics. And he says, of all forms of servitude, that is the hardest which subjects you to a republic. First, because it is more lasting and there is no hope of escape. So it's easier to get rid of a tyrant in other words. Secondly, because the aim of a republic is to deprive all other corporations of their vitality and to weaken them to the end that its own body corporate may increase. A prince who makes you his subject does not do this unless he be a barbarian who devastates the country and destroys all that man has done for civilization as oriental princes do. On the contrary, if his institutions be humane and he behave constitutionally, he will more often than not be equally fond of all the cities that are subject to him and will leave them in possession of all their trades and all their ancient institutions. So wow. that seems to anticipate um, Hans Hermann Hoppe, the, the democracy, the God that fails. Yes, but Joanne, I'm a fan of... Hans Hermann Hoppe, I'm sure you also appreciate his work. Recently, a, I published a piece for Mises arguing that, and is actually correct, on average, monarchies are better for growth and the protection of property rights than democracies. And I would love to, to interview Hans on the show. Again, Cato and Bound are the feature on monarchies, and they did not refer to Hans. Or maybe I should check, but I don't remember seeing his name. Wow. And, and actually brought the issue to the forefront. So how can you produce an entire feature on monarchs and growth and you don't mention and Erman Hop? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, but... and is a brilliant scholar, but unfortunately un, un, under, underrated, se severely underrated. But back to Machiavelli. Yes. Machiavelli viewed wealth creation as a positive sum game, not a zero sum game. And, if, and I'm going to read this quote for the audience. One observes, two, how riches multiply and abound there, alike those that come from agriculture and those that are produced by the trades. For everybody is eager to acquire such things and to obtain property, provided he be convinced that he will enjoy it when it has been acquired. Well, creation is not a zero sum game and implicit in this statement is also the concept of comparative advantage. Some people engage in trade, some are agriculturalists. Yes, and thank you for reading that quote. <laughs> I think that's another um, piece of evidence of Machiavelli's respect for civil society and the free market and uh, warning for a prince to stay away from intervention. And if we continue with the quote, quote Joanne, is also in favor of competition. It thus comes about that in competition, one with the other, men look both to their own advantage and to that of the public, so that in both respects, wonderful progress is made. Spontaneous order. <laughs> I Well, obviously I have questions, yes. but I, I just have to read these lines so that our audience can gain a deeper appreciation. And I will be posting it to my channel on YouTube and also to my Twitter page. And again, Joanne, 
because you have been studying the issue for such a long time, you're not impressed, but but I am, and we are. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, it's it's re- re- really fascinating. But but Joanne, tell us a little about the the discourses. Why is that important? Because so far we have been talking about the prince, and this article forces us to draw parallels between Machiavelli's political thought and its relationship to to, to the book, the prince. But tell us about the discourses. I think with the discourses, it becomes more evident that Machiavelli was um, say raised in the kind of a Republican mindset as compared to a monarchical um, mindset. And he um, tries to go through contemporary Italy by evoking the Roman past. And he thinks that history can be of use not only for esoteric knowledge, but as a guide in the present. Not everyone agreed with him. His contemporary um, Francesco Guicciardi didn't think much of that idea, but um, Machiavelli implored his contemporaries to study Roman history. And he was writing about the Republic and, and about Republican government at a time while the Medici were in power and when Florence was not a Republic. And so again, I think it was a, an act of, say, an independent mind uh, at, attempting to make sense of history and to see how history could be a guide for the present. Wow, what a brilliant mind. And, and, and Joanne, uh, both of us are fond of Walter Block, and Walter Block has written on the economic freedom of the world. And in your smile when I mentioned Walter, I did as a guest twice. But again, Machiavelli was an economic genius. Remember, there is a link between economic freedom and growth. And in this piece, you're saying that Machiavelli was not supportive of the state when the government intruded into the economy and you cite existing data. Tell us a little, a, a little, a, a, tell us a, a little about Machiavelli's critiques of the state, an activist state at least. Hmm, I'm not sure what I could add to the comments that I, that I made. Um, He doesn't, in, at least in, in the prince, he doesn't anticipate the prince being active <clears throat> in the day-to-day uh, governing, but to set competent um, people in institutions that would uh, ensure the, the just laws. <clears throat> and, and so I think it would, would be a, say, a minimal state as opposed to a uh, state capitalism to use Anthony de, de, ah, Anthony de, de Gassi's, um analysis for the state, just say. <clears throat> wow, but he, I... he, he doesn't give a very deep description as far as I can remember. <clears throat> Yeah, so so um, with the prince. When he's talking about the prince, he's talking about the prince gaining how, for example, Cesare Borgia <clears throat> gained territory and attempted to um, maintain that territory. So that the figure who stands out the most in the prince, Cesare Borgia, takes on the role of the military commander more than that of a ruler or a governor. Yes. And uh, Joanne, do you know why I appreciate this text? Because you keep citing people I love, like Albert J. Nock. I'm a big fan of Albert J. Nock, too. And there's a difference between the state and society. And again, this was rash by Machiavelli, and I'm going to read it for our audience. Although the concepts of society and state are sometimes confused or intentionally merged in our discourse, Albert J. Knox shows that the opposition between social power and state power is an essential one. 
every assumption of state power, whether by gift or seizure, leaves society with so much less power. There is never nor can be any strengthening of state power without a corresponding and roughly equivalent depletion of so, so, social power. Again, Joanne, we're individuals. Not, the, the state does not reflect our interest. The state and the individual are not the same. And I'm saying this to illuminate my own critique of protectionism. This is a tangential point, but as a consumer, I desire a product and I do not need to be compelled to care about how politicians feel. That's not my business. So I'm, we're, we're, we're not getting ahead of ourselves, but maybe at some point, you, you're not ready to write a book yet, but maybe at some point as libertarians, we may have to systematize Machiavelli's thought and then create the libertarian reader to Machiavelli. Maybe, or to, to any number of other writers. I think that going back through history, and with the lens of Austrian economics and libertarianism, it's possible to see any number of writers from a different viewpoint. So it's not to discover all of a sudden a bunch of libertarians, but to, to go back and to reassess political writing, fictional writing, historical writing uh, from the point of view of the individual versus the collective and um, freedom versus uh, the state. Yeah, because you mentioned Austrian economics, Joanne, did Machiavelli imply anything about entrepreneurs? There, I mean, there may be comments that are, are out there, but he seems to have a healthy respect for them and for the workings of the economy, even as he tells his friend that he's ignorant of economics. Machiavelli was, was fake in modesty. His views are, are quite prescient and, and correct. <laughs> But maybe if we dig deeper, then we're going to be in a position to furnish a broader concept of the entrepreneur in Machiavelli's thought and the nexus between the entrepreneur and state relations. My God. And if, if I didn't, and, and, and this is one of the reasons why I try not to be a close thinker. So I studied literature as a student up to the up to A level. So Jamaica was a colony of Britain. So we don't say A levels anymore, we say Cape. But I studied literature up to the Cape level and I had brilliant teachers. But at one point I looked at literature and economics in in, in a segmentary sense. But because of your work, I'm I'm better able to see the, the lines of parallel. So and I, I know you're not fond of flattery and no serious person should really enjoy compliments, but again. You have no idea as to the impact of this brief 26 pages docu document impact on, on, on my future thought because I've, I've yet to write anything on Machiavelli or literature. But Joanne, where but maybe you, you will look actually Lipton, um, with your knowledge of economics, it may be that you will write something on Machiavelli and the entrepreneur. It, it's, it's a little bit out of my area of ex ex expertise. It's about maybe a, a decade that I've been interested in Austrian economics and libertarianism, but certainly I'm not an expert. So I would love to read what you write on Machiavelli if you decide to. Yeah, uh, I, I should. And when, I have a piece today on my, it's, it's on war and Steven Pinker. Did you see it? Not yet. I haven't looked on online yet today. I look yeah, forward to yeah, reading it. Yeah, man. So I, I, but the, the essence of the piece is that Steven Pinker is not incorrect, but he should revisit his argument because the puzzle is that crime is seeing a dramatic decline in the West, but not elsewhere. And this could be as a result of cognitive, environmental, and intelligence factors. So the question is this. Violence is increasing in the developing world, but it is tapering in the West. Why? We don't know yet. Because many have been critiquing Pinker on the basis that violence is 
on the increase in other parts of the world and ter terrorism is a problem. But, but after surveying the data, I came to the conclusion that Pinker is not inept. He should just revisit his, his work more broadly. I hope he has the guts. But Joanne, you also wrote a piece for Mises on a play, P Pietro Marcelo Martin, Martin, Martin Eden. Tell us, ab tell us about it's it. The film. Yes, the film. Go ahead. I, I don't know much about Listen, Martin Eden. I hope, okay, I really hope you will see this film and then you'll th tell me if you um, yeah. agree with my reading or not, because I absolutely love the film. My daughter had been telling me to watch it for a long time. And out of curiosity, I went online to see what the reviews said about it. And I was so disappointed to find that the idea, the say the leftist collectivist ideology um, of the various reviewers gave a completely different picture of the film than I had just watched. And so I actually watched it again. <laughs> and I, I don't write film reviews as a, uh, as a habit, but I felt so passionately that this was a film that libertarians should see and that was being misconstrued uh, in the reviews that I just sat down and first I read the Jack London novel, Martin Eden from uh, 1909, that the film was based on in order to see what the director and the, the director and another screenwriter had done differently from the novel. And I felt that even though the novel was rather ambiguous, it was supposed to be an indictment of the individualist by the socialist Jack London, but it was heavily autobiographical so that the protagonist had a lot of characteristics and experiences that uh, Jack London himself um, uh, uh, had, according, at least according to the um, introduction of, of the novel. And it, it had an ambiguous, but uh, in places somewhat socialist collectivist uh, uh, tendency. The film, on the other hand, very eloquently um, through the protagonist of Martin Eden, who works himself um, from a sailor to a famous writer, uh, through his statements, through his actions, um, is an indictment of socialism and collectivism in favor of uh, individualism. In, in many forms. So on the one hand, self-reliance, on the other hand, respect for the individual. Um, the, the director looks into the faces of many figures who are not part of the actual story. And these faces look back at us. These are individuals, these everyone is unique. And this comes across so strong in the film that I was um, compelled to write the uh, the piece that I did. Yeah, and, and I read your piece, all of it. And as you do know by now, when I'm reading a piece, I pay attention to the footnotes, the in the, the in-text citation. So I've I'm yet to watch the film or do a thorough research, but I trust your judgment and Martin Eden it seems to be individualistic. So, for example, there is an anti-union strand throughout the, the novel, and in the end, he becomes quite successful, and his critics they benefit from his success. Furthermore, there is also the, 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 the that dichotomy between the state and individual freedom, and the extent to which socialists are actually in favor of the so-called working class. So I think it's an interesting film and a film and an interesting review, and I may post that too. But Joanne, these days I am planning to do shorter, shorter videos. We have been talking for nearly one hour. I really appreciate your time, but unfortunately we have to wrap up. So bye, and it's always a pleasure speaking to you, Joanne. All right then, bye.